Body Rappers Angela Luzio is delighted to sponsor this episode of Conversations on Dance. Body Rappers Angela Luzio is known for its total stretch tights and Angela Luzio shoes. Tyler Peck, principal dancer with the New York City Ballet, is its spokesperson and designer of Tyler Peck Designs for Premiere. Tyler's beautiful original leotard designs fit perfectly, are ideal for class, rehearsal, or performance, and move well with the body and won't ride up in the back. Body Wrappers makes additional apparel for all types of dance and significant to dance teachers this time of year. Body Wrappers performance wear remix for competition and recitals consists of various components one can mix and match to create a unique costume you won't see anywhere else. You may view all the products at bodywrappers.com or to purchase Body Wrappers performance wear remix items, go to your favorite local dance retailer shop or online store. To view and buy the entire collection of Tyler Peck designs, go to dancewearcorner.com. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Breeden. And you're listening to Conversations on Dance. Welcome to the last Conversations on Dance full format episode of 2017. Over this past year, our podcast has grown more than we could have ever fathomed with over 110,000 listens last month alone. We want to thank all of you, our listeners, for your support and we wish you a very happy holidays and a happy new year. Though we won't be releasing any more full episodes until January, this week we will be in Tampa, Florida at Next Generation Ballet, teaching master classes, hosting a live lecture, and recording content surrounding their Nutcracker performances. We will be chatting with New York City Ballet principals Sarah Mearns and Amar Ramasar, who will be dancing the Sugar Plum Potida, as well as former Miami City Ballet principal Patricia Delgado and current MCB principal Renan Serdiero, who will also be guesting with Next Generation Ballet. We will be releasing bonus content later this week to celebrate the ballet that consumes us all right now, the Nutcracker. So stay tuned. We have posted ticket information for Next Generation Ballet on our Facebook page. For our final episode of 2017, we are saluting this year's biggest ballet celebration, 50 years of George Balanchine's Jewels. Today, we take an in-depth look at Jewels with Bob Gottlieb, author, editor, and dance critic. Bob has been editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster, Alfred A. Knopf, and The New Yorker. Gottlieb is widely considered to be one of the greatest editors of the second half of the 20th century. For many years, he was associated with the New York City Ballet during Balanchine's time, often contributing to programming and serving on the board of directors. He currently sits on the board of trustees of Miami City Ballet. We always enjoy talking with Bob and sometimes veer off topic, and in this case, around 45 minutes into this episode, our bunhead sides take over. Today, we talk extensively with Bob about Balanchine's process, the premiere of Jewels, the original cast, and how the ballet is being danced today. Bob, you've so graciously welcomed us into your home today. We're so happy to be here with you in person. Um, But uh, we'd like to start by uh, kind of giving some background on how maybe you first met Balanchine and when you became more uh, associated with him. Well, when I was just 17, a millennium ago, uh, a wonderful young teacher at my school, the only wonderful teacher in my school, and she lasted a year, took me to a matinee performance at the city center of Ballet Society. And that was in the spring of 1948. And it was the week of the premiere of Orpheus. I was not at that, this was a matinee. And I I had been to the ballet a number of times, but nothing had caught me. And Orpheus did it. It was my first look at Balanchine and that was it for life. And that fall of 48, Ballet Society morphed into the New York City Ballet, and I started college at Columbia. So I was here for the first four years, and at the city center, morning, noon, and night, except there were only performances on a couple of afternoons and night. But I would have been in there in the morning if I had been (laughs) able to. I was just completely enraptured by Balanchine and everything he did and was. But I knew nothing about the world of ballet. I certainly didn't know anyone or had any interest in knowing it. These were gods up there. I was this little scruffy nerd who just loved it. (laughs) And time went by, time went by. I went to Cambridge, I came back. I was always going to City Ballet. And then at some point in my publishing career, uh, I left Simon & Schuster, of which I'd been editor-in-chief, and went to run Alfred A. Knopf. And at some point, Martha Swope, the uh, official photographer of New York City Ballet, whom we knew I'd known forever, in other, for other reasons, 
called me and said that Lincoln Kirstein was thinking of writing a big book about New York City ballet with her pictures from the later years and George Platt Lyons' great pictures from the early years. Would I be interested? Said, yes. They came in. That was my first meeting with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. So we did that book, and it was wonderful to do, and it was fabulous. And then I worked with Lincoln on his beautiful Nijinsky dancing book. And that, again, was... By this time... You can't say one you were a friend of Lincoln's because that was not what he was. But he was a, a great person, a charming, brilliant, wonderful man. And I was completely in awe of him. Probably the first and only man I've ever been completely in awe of. Because Balanchine is something else. There's no point in having a personal feeling about Balanchine. He... <laughs> and Lincoln then introduced me to George. But Lincoln was developing a new board of directors separating out the New York City Ballet from the New York City Center Board. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to be on it, and I explained that I couldn't raise money, and he said, no, I don't need you to raise money. I need you to be there at the crucial moment, because I have to have someone on that board who understands ballet and the company, by which he meant the moment when Balanchine would no longer would die or would no longer be able to function. Mm -hmm. So I said, on that basis, fine. So I joined the board. Well, I'm not a board person. A boards put me off because they're well-meaning people and we need them, but they're not knowledgeable. Right. So I would attend meetings. And, but then one night, Betty Cage, the great company manager, had dinners every, uh, every Monday night. She had dinners for Lincoln and his friends because they were very, very close. And I was very close to Betty. And I would be frequently at those dinners. And one night... They were complaining about the fact that families were not coming to family matinees on Saturdays and Sundays. Neither of them had ever been a parent, maybe had never had ever seen a baby. I have no idea of a child. <laughs> so I said, hey, you don't really think that parents are going to bring their children to see Bugaku? <laughs> Lincoln whirled on me and said, you're interested in programming? Help Betty. So within six months, I was doing the programming of the New York City Ballet, which I went on doing for 10 or 12 years through George and for a number of years with Peter. And then I slowly, because nobody was in charge of marketing, took that over also. This was all from my offices, first at Knopf and then at the New York. Mm -hmm. So during that period, which, as you know, coming from a ballet company, there is a crisis every 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there were many, many crises, and some of them required... Balanchine, and I was very involved. I was on the steering committee of the board of directors, whatever it was. So I was constantly in his presence. Also, twice a year, as I was about to do the programming, because we had two seasons, mm -hmm. I would have to ask him and Jerry Robbins what new ballets they were making, because you can't program. If it says Ballet by Balanchine, that does not tell you whether it's an opener or a closer, two people, 40 people, sure, sure. who's in it. So I would go and talk to him, and he would he wasn't really very interested, you know. Mm -hmm. He'd seen it all. He'd done it all. He'd say, you know, I think I make this, that, maybe, I don't know. Uh -huh. Jerry, of course, was fanatical. <laughs> so then there would be moments. I'd have to call him at home. There was a crisis, blah, 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 blah. So through those years, I spent a lot of time, I would say, next to him. With him is not accurate, because that... He was impersonal. I don't mean he was unfriendly. He was the most courteous, mm -hmm. polite, pleasant person. But I never felt I was with a human being with whom I had any connection. Why would I want it? Mm -hmm. What was I going to say to him? George, your ballets are great. <laughs> I mean, it's ridiculous. So I would just be there. But what he was like was, if you were standing next to him or sitting next to him, he would say what was on his mind. Mm -hmm. You happened to be next to him, so you heard it. But twice during those years, toward the later part, once, I remember it totally, I was backstage with him, backstage left in the wings. Usually he was on the right. For some reason, we were on the, right, uh, on the left. Peter and Suzanne were dancing. And he said, you know, dear, everyone was dear. It wasn't, I wasn't dear. You know, dear, it has to be Peter. He knows what a ballerina needs. 
meaning what a great partner he was, and he was the greatest partner ever. So I was completely absorbed into the New York City. I traveled with the company. I was at Saratoga with the company. A couple of times I was staying in the house that George was living in with Karen and her family. So we, that's my relationship with Valentin. I was there to serve him. I, had, I don't think I ever had a meal with him. There was just nothing there personal there. The real reason that we want to talk to you today and we want to get your immense knowledge is to talk about Jules, which uh-huh. is celebrating its 50th anniversary this year and companies around the world are performing it. So um, we wanted to just start at the beginning with the idea for the ballet and how that kind of came about and maybe when you first got wind of it. Well, I only knew what everybody knew because in 1967, I had no connection to the company. Mm. I think the first dancer I ever met was Janet Reed, whom you don't, wouldn't even remember, but she was a wonderful, wonderful dancer. The original cast of Fancy Free. And she, Rebecca did her role. Oh, right. The, the first it. girl. It was so fun. <laughs> when Judy staged it? Um, um, no, no. This was in-house. More Lourdes recent, coached it because uh, Lourdes, Lourdes, Lourdes was the original JP, City Ballet. Yeah. JP said it, yeah. Mm-hmm. But I didn't, I didn't want to know ballet people. Mm-hmm. I mean, I had my world. They had their world. However, once... I got involved. I knew I knew everyone, but back in 1967, I didn't know anybody. So I knew this big thing was company coming, and it seemed so odd. And there was a lot of fuss made, a lot of publicity about the jewels. And he went to Van Cleef and Arpels and got excited by jewels. Who knows? Who knows who said it? He may have said it. Lincoln may have said it. I can't imagine the publicity department said it because they were as incompetent as you can. Um, it was unrun. See, the New York City Valley was, at that point, was still a mom and pop store. Right. Mm-hmm. That's why someone on the outside Even in 67. was able, yes, was still, oh, later than that. Really? When I got involved, it was because of that. Uh-huh. Because the management had aged, nobody knew it was in, everyone was exhausted. Betty wasn't interested in programming anymore. George had seen it all. You know, Lincoln was what more... What year were you what? first involved? What year was it that you first became involved with the company? Well... It must have been around 72 or 3 or 4, something like that. So I was around, I guess, for the last 10 years of George's Mm -hmm. life. Uh, So Jules was this big event. Mm -hmm. So I had bought my tickets, not for the opening. I didn't go to opening. What did I know from openings? Uh But the first week. So I saw it first in its first week. The reception was very complicated. Because there were those who thought it was great. There were those who thought it was a glitzy audience trap, Mm -hmm. but that it really had no validity, although they liked this better than... There's a lot of talk about which one do you prefer. This one's the greatest, not that one. I love rubies, I love diamonds. (laughs) Emeralds is boring, emeralds is divine. There was a lot of that. The reviews were good. Clive Barnes was crazy about it, and he was the chief reviewer for the New York Times at that point. And that was true throughout the world when it opened. Mostly, though, it was an audience hit, Mm -hmm. and tickets were hard to get. It was one of the company's big hits. Mm -hmm. The first big hit was Firebird. That that made the company popular. Mm -hmm. Until then, nobody came but the elite. Mm-hmm. Firebird was a hit, and then there was Nutcracker, and there was this, there was that. But Jules was a tremendous hit. Later came Vienna Waltzes, another huge hit. Dances at a Gathering, another huge hit. So when I saw it, the performances were so great that it was very hard to, you know, I wasn't a critic, I didn't think critically. Mm-hmm. I just said, Jules was ravishingly beautiful. And the music was so beautiful. I didn't know that music. You know, it was without the coda at that time, the ending with the seven people Mm -hmm. and the boys kneeling. That didn't exist at that time. But Violette was so brilliant, so charming, so elegant, a quality that has left our shores, by the way. Mm -hmm. Uh, Rubies, of course, was Eddie and Patty at their greatest. They were sublime. They were so wonderful together. We'll go back to what Ruby's should be. Mm-hmm. And Pat Neary was wonderful, you know, as the second girl. And then Diamonds was the apotheosis of Suzanne. And Jacques was her partner. Mm-hmm. And he was a wonderful partner, but it was not about him. It was about her. Mm-hmm. 
And he created this for her. So here was this fabulous success. And the years went by and it held its own. It didn't vanish the way some hits vanish because it had so much substance. So then it went through many, many casts. None of them ever approached the first cast. The most interesting thing about that is that while that was the company, when it was Suzanne and then Peter and Patty and Eddie, Violette and other wonderful dancers, everyone assumed that when those people were gone, no one could replace Suzanne because she was so great and so unique mm -hmm. and so glorious. What happened was that the roles that he created on her, particularly diamonds, were classical to a large extent, mm -hmm. which meant that they could be danced in different ways by different people. So that we've had many wonderful dancers in diamonds, none of them Suzanne, mm -hmm. but with a few exceptions who will be nameless, everyone who did it was up to the job and made a, a presentable and convincing diamonds girl. Even when in Balanchine's lifetime, he had, because Suzanne left the company, he had oh, yes. Kay, Merrill, and Allegra Absolutely. all dancing, all very different dancers. Totally different, and all of them very good. Mm. What turned out impossible, what turned out to be impossible, was replacing Patricia McBride. Mm -hmm. because, not just in Ruby's. Her roles have been the hardest roles to fill properly. I mean, think about who cares. For years and years and years, we had a succession of girls doing Patty's role, perfectly good dancers. They just didn't have it. He took her. He took what he always did was he took the qualities of the dancer he wanted to use and created the role out of those qualities. Mm -hmm. He didn't do what Jerry did, which is to create a role and then shove you into it and make you <laughs> hew to the original, even when you weren't capable of it. Right. So Ruby's, and there have been excellent dancers in it, giving their all, as all our dancers do, with a couple of exceptions. Um, no one ever came close to Patty. Did Balanchine ever cast anyone else in that role while he was you know, alive? I don't remember. Oh, yes, there was a hilarious thing he did. But, there were, I think there were only two roles that he didn't cast Farrell in, if they were even remotely possible for her. Uh -huh. And she wanted to do Who Cares. Hmm. She, I know, she did Who Cares, right? There's a Croce review it. of it, yeah. She did it yeah. in. She did it in. <laughs> he let her, finally, he just, she nagged, I guess, so much. He said yes. And it was horrifying. I mean, she was totally... And she saw that right away, and that was the end of that. So she was one person who did it when he was there because he allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. And there probably were others. I just, I just don't remember. Because remember, I wasn't going every night. See, I, I would go to the ballet then, either with Arlene Croce, because she was a critic, I wasn't a critic, right. until I got involved with the company, programming and marketing, I just went. I either paid it for a ticket, right. and I didn't have much money, or I'd go with, or I'd go with Lincoln. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I was with Lincoln many, many times, but it wasn't all the time. Once I was involved, I had to really know what was going on day to day, mm -hmm. because you can't program unless you understand what the ballets are, how they might fit together, mm -hmm. and what dancers are here, what dancers are there, what they can do. So I didn't see everybody do everything until later, probably the mid-70s. By then I was seeing everybody do everything. Right. So that was what happened. Ruby's never was as satisfactory and nobody was ever Eddie. And nobody since then has understood, in my view, what those two people are doing on that stage. Hmm. What is that? Well, they are in a love-hate adoring, complicit rivalry, carrying on, being glamorous, being heady, being provocative, you know, egging each other on. It, it was just an extraordinary partnership, everything they did together. And now you see people who don't, well, 
if we can go to this recent thing where the three world companies did jewels at the Coke Theater. I hate to say Coke Theater, State Theater. You don't have to. It's our, it's our podcast. We can say what we yeah. want. We can say what we want. <laughs> uh, you remember the, pa- the Paris Ballet did emeralds. Mm-hmm. They did all the emeralds. Right. And the rubies and the diamonds were shared by the Bolshoi and City ba- New York City Ballet. The girl who did rubies and the boy who did rubies simply didn't have a clue as to what it was. I don't rem- I don't know who staged it, and I don't want to know for them. But the Russians, somebody must have said the word syncopation to them. I don't think they knew what it meant. They certainly didn't grasp the music. And these two people were up on that stage, neither a particularly good dancer. They didn't even acknowledge each other's existence. Right. They were not in the same ballet, they were not, they weren't in any ballet, they weren't on the same stage. It was so terrible that it was a disgrace. It was the worst performance, I think, of a major Balanchine ballet that I've ever seen, and I've seen plenty. You know, I think it's interesting that someone like Patty, what can happen to her roles is they can either veer into cuteness Mm -hmm. or vulgarity we've seen both both qualities i don't think were really present in patty i mean it's so funny that they would go that way the best one i've seen i don't know that anyone agrees since recently it was lauren lovett she's an interesting dancer she's been on the podcast she has (laughs) and she was very very good in it now when it came to diamonds the russians produced a girl of such greatness. She was like, nobody can decide whether she was 17 or 18. <laughs> this must have been her first major appearance in a major role. Wow. And it was certainly her first diamonds. Mm-hmm. From the moment, I was with Lourdes. Lourdes and I were together. Mm-hmm. From the moment she was on the stage, we were in ecstasy. She didn't look like Suzanne, but she had the quality. She was young. She was innocent. She was glamorous. She was musical. She was technical. She was lyrical. She was grand. She was everything. Mm. She sailed through it and got stronger and stronger. We were both, obviously, when we checked with each other afterwards, we were terrified that it was going to collapse in some way. Not at all. Not at all. And we could see the director of the Bolshoi was sitting a few... uh, Miles in front of us, and we could see at the beginning he was nervous. He was sort of hitting, his, mm-hmm. and then you could see him relax because it had pulled off. And not only was she wonderful in diamonds, but the core was wonderful because our core has been doing it forever, mm-hmm. and I don't think they feel this is the height of their career. And they are competent; the girls are great, but it's not a thrill to them to be doing it. Right. And the same with the Demis. Whereas the Bolshoi girl, they were so happy. And you know, that can get tiresome, the first part of Diamonds, before the, the principles arrive. There wasn't a moment that I wasn't completely invested in it. Mm-hmm. So that was thrilling. But the rubies, a disaster. Because you can do what you can do. Diamonds is Russian. It's Russian music, it's Russian style, it's grand style. They know what to do. Rubies, they don't have a clue. And I don't, I probably, and you can't send a coach over for six weeks or whatever and teach them Balanchine's style and Stravinsky's style in right. a few weeks and teach them the ballet. Right. It takes a long time. Now, emeralds, I hated what the Paris Opera did. But I don't like the Paris Opera style. Mm -hmm. And I live a lot in Paris, so I've seen more of them than most people would have seen. They're so deliberate. They're so grand. They're they're so, here am I about to show you my beautiful arabesque. Mm -hmm. And then they show it to you. And then they do the next thing that they show. They just, one girl was good. The rest was just all point. They were making points. Mm -hmm. It was horrible. So which ballet do you think um, has kind of evolved the most over time? Or what what have these ballets' evolutions been like? What's missing well, since the original? Emeralds. Emeralds can work 
for different companies in different ways. Violette was unique. No one is ever going to look like her. But that's all right, because that role can be done in other ways. Uh, we've done it well. We're doing it well now. I've seen the rehearsals. Uh, we have several very good people in it. Ruby's is the hardest, mm -hmm. because for all the reasons I was saying. And you can do it this way, you can do it that way. We'll see. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's interesting, because Ruby's is more or less the only one of the three that is commonly performed in its own yes. right. So it's the most fragile, and yet it's the most commonly done. Well, it's not the most fragile. It's the most difficult in the sense, in that sense of style. Sure, sure, okay. Emeralds is the most fragile because if you don't have the atmosphere of emeralds, it's gone. Right. Let's, let's talk about emeralds for a second because I think emeralds is unlike any ballet in the camp. And it's always been my favorite of the three. It's my favorite as yeah. well. Good taste. <laughs> Good taste. You can't, you can't oh. do without it. But it's, I think it's an unusual opener and I don't know. Everyone what, knew it. Right. Violette knew it. She said, you know, she said it's a difficult opener. It's dreamy. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not what you expect. It's mysterious. Right. There's no bang bang. There's no no juice in that Almost sense. There's no beat at points. There's no beat. Yeah. It's not that. But it's ravishingly beautiful. And when he improved it by adding the coda and another, uh, he added something else for Violet the, the pa with the Violet. Pa. In. It, it's. When it's done well, it's ravishingly beautiful, and it holds the audience, even though they're not sure why they're being held. Mm. Rubies can work for an audience, no matter how vulgar it is, because they don't know it's vulgar. They think that's what it is. Right. Mm. And diamonds, well, the ending is so grand. Mm. How can you not go out of the theater soaring, you know? And those polonaises that he did again, you know, they're just great and when it was farrell and and jacques he was wonderful in it and then farrell and martins there was nothing like it remembered you never saw him of course peter peter no i would i wasn't born when he retired you weren't born <laughs> you were born too late well you know what he was like as a partner in mm -hmm. in diamonds there would be suzanne doing what she was doing and then suddenly an arm would be stretched from nowhere, mm -hmm. from nine yards away, and it would be on her waist and give her just what she needed. And then she wasn't interested in it. <laughs> you know. But it was fabulously beautiful. Right. And in the walking part, with it, they were just so beautiful together. And they were both very beautiful. You know, you don't get a couple like that all the time. Mm -hmm. So it was, it's never been the same, but it's been wonderful. And with this Russian girl, I wish you'd seen it. She was something. So this is a ballet that's so commonly um, referred to. So many people will talk about this first cast, talk about Suzanne and Diamonds, or I'm learning Violet's part and Emeralds, that sort of thing. So do you feel like sometimes dancers get hung up a little bit trying to emulate this first cast? I wish they would. Ah. <laughs> I don't think Maybe so. They don't know now, what's more. interesting is mm -hmm. um, Maria Kurowski who's very beautiful herself, very grand in her look. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Her look, her configuration, her plastique is the closest to Farrell's. Mm -hmm. She looks like Farrell. When she does the movements, I can immediately see Farrell. You can see, oh, this ballet was made on Suzanne Farrell. <laughs> you know, other people who may dance it as well, you don't, see that at all. Mearns, Sarah Mearns, dances it very well, but she dances it as if she's in Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. She doesn't dance it. She, she in no way resembles Suzanne. Mm -hmm. So to watch Kurowski is to see a sketch of Farrell. Mm -hmm. And she's, she's gotten better and better and strong. She was, you know, she looks so strong and with those legs. And so, but she was not a strong dancer at the beginning. Her back was weak. She, she didn't, she'd had the look, but she didn't have the confidence. Right. 
or the strength, the opposite of a dancer like Ashley Bowder, who came on with more confidence than anyone needs, you know, a wonderful dancer in many ways. But but if you want to get a sense of Farrell without looking at Farrell tapes, to look at Maria Kurowski shows you what she was like. Mm -hmm. Maria Kurowski is not as great a dancer as Suzanne Farrell, but who is? Who is? Right. <laughs> right. That's true. Yeah. Uh, you know, I wanted to talk, go, if we want to go back to the beginning, go to Emerald. Mm -hmm. um, uh, why do you think Balanchine chose that specific, those, he selected he put different, it together. right, he put, he put it together because it's not just, it's not one piece it's of from different ever. operas and different incidental music. It was clearly on his mind. Well, you know, he was very connected in, to France. Mm -hmm. Remember, his Diaghilev years were spent in France. They were located down there, and he's, his French was very good. Mm -hmm. It was Diaghilev found him in France, so he lived there, and he had connections there. And he made a number of French ballets, you know. But this, so it was, when he decided to do Jules, it was clear that if he was going to do three styles of ballet. They were going to be the three basic styles, French, Russian, and American. Mm -hmm. Because although we all know it came from Italy, but there's no Italian style of ballet. There's just, right. you know, there was just a lot of technique. Right. Uh, so French, what was he going to do? Well, he obviously always loved Fauré's music. And you know, with him, one of the amazing things was he had things in his mind that he wanted to do or thought of doing. And then he would do them. And if he couldn't do them this year, because he didn't have the dances or he didn't have the money or it didn't fit the repertory, he would do it next year. And if he didn't do it next year, he'd do it 20 years later. Like Midsummer, right? It took him that many years. To many, many years. Together, right? But this was true of many things. Sure. So I believe, I imagine, that he was listening to Foray and thinking of Foray throughout his life. Sure. The opportunity came. Now I can do Faure. So he sat at the piano, as you know. He worked on all the music because he was an expert pianist, trained pianist. He sat there putting Faure pieces together, choosing this, choosing that, choosing the other, choosing that. So he was ready. He had it in his head. He didn't go into the studio, like some choreographers we will not mention, who don't know what they're doing or why they're doing it. And somebody said, why don't you use this piece of Dvorak? They say, okay, I'll do that. You know, mm. it wasn't like that. Right. He was ready for everything. Mm. And he knew his dancers. Remember, he brought Violette Verdi from, he brought France to the New York City Ballet. The company was at a low point when Violette arrived. That was right after Tanny contracted polio, right? Tanny, Tall Chief was finished. Uh, it was not, and he was depressed. It was not strong. And I remember a whole period when things were not great. And there have been so many such periods. And what did he do? He brought in Violet Verdi, a great, not only a star, but a charmer. Mm -hmm. And someone on whom he could make different kind of roles, which was what he was always looking for. You know, Allegra, he knew what to do with, and he knew what she could do. Mm -hmm. And of course, he worshipped her dancing and made these amazing roles out of her. But he needed brio. Mm -hmm. he, mm -hmm. he needed style, elegance. That's not what he was going to get from Allegra. So she, I, it, my view as an audience member who knew nothing mm -hmm. and who had no connection, I felt at that time, this woman, about whom I knew nothing, has rescued the company at this moment. Mm -hmm. The way when Suzanne left, Patty rescued the company. Mm -hmm. So he had her. So he had Foray in his head, I'm sure. He had Violet. Hey, way to go. And in Mimi Paul, he had a very beautiful girl mm -hmm. whom he could create a different kind of thing from. He had a wonderful partner for Violet in Conrad Ludlow, who was a wonderful partner for everybody. So why not? Go for it. And that's why we got Emeralds. Now, had Violet Verdi not been brought into the company, we would not have had Emeralds. Because he was he, he couldn't have okay. found someone to make that feeling from. Mm -hmm. So, she was so like, he the thing about George was above everything else, he was practical. Mm 
Mm-hmm. That's what I learned from my years of, of service to him. I remember if I called him about to, I tried never to do, interrupt him at home. But there were three or four times when something had to be decided right away. Or, and if I called and said, George, we have a problem, he perked up. <laughs> he loved solving problems. Mm. So give him a problem, he was a happy man. Of course, he always did solve it uh-huh. in two seconds. The opening night of the Tchaikovsky Festival. That's great. <laughs> Opening night of the Tchaikovsky Festival was in peril because during the day when this Philip Johnson gla- cubes, plastic cubes were put in for the first time and the lights were shown on them, they started to smell. No one knew they would do that. And the theater was rank. Oh, no. Also, one of them fell and almost hit a stagehand, missed him by two feet. Oh. And I happened to leave my office for whatever reason. I wanted to go up, look in the theater, see what was going on. So I was just sitting there. And the smell was considerable. Still, this was afternoon. Nobody knew what was happening. Nobody knew what was going to happen with these cubes. It was hysteria. What was George Balanchine doing? He couldn't help with the cubes. He couldn't help with the smell. He couldn't calm the He was sitting in the orchestra, adjusting Merrill Ashley's tiara for Swan Lake. He wasn't happy with it. And he sat there with her for, I don't know, 20 minutes, half an hour, trying this, trying that, trying the other, until he had it the way he wanted it. So what was he doing? There was one problem he could fix, so he fixed it. (laughs) See, so all the talk about inspiration, he didn't believe in inspiration. He believed in, here's the job, get it done. Because remember, when Diaghilev hired him, in 1924. It was mostly to make opera ballets. Mm -hmm. He had to throw on ballets for Carmen, ballets for Thais, ballets for anything in 10 minutes. And he did it. That's what he did. It was make work. He loved it. And the dancers, because he didn't take three hours waiting for inspiration. He'd say, oh, we're doing this. Okay, you go there. (laughs) It was done. It was a problem to solve. He solved it. I love that. Yeah. I think that's a great story. <laughs> um, I wanted to touch upon something we had brought up. You brought up a, a little bit ago about him um, creating additional sections in Emeralds. Uh, do you know what, what in, inspired him <laughs> to, uh, <laughs> to bring that later on? I assume he felt that the ballet wasn't finished, mm-hmm. that he had more to say and that there was more foray that he wanted to say. And you know, you remember before the code of Emeralds, ends with one of those, everybody's there right. smiling, and and it looks like a finale closer. Right. And in fact, as you will remember, everybody starts applauding as if it was the end yes. of the ballad. Right. Mm-hmm. And conductors and the dancers sort of had to learn, try to learn, how to do it so the audience isn't on its way up the aisle. Mm-hmm. But he didn't want to end, I'm, and this is my guess, Uh, I certainly never discussed such a thing with him. My guess is that he didn't want to end Emeralds with a splash because it is not like that. Right. It's sad. It's melancholic. It's nostalgic. It's beautiful. He wanted to end on that note. Right. And so finally the time came. He had the time. He had the dances. They were bringing it back. He did it. That was that. Mm Mm-hmm. And here's a horrible story. I happened to be in St. Petersburg the first time the Kirov, now, yes, the first time the Kirov, now again the Mariinsky, but not then, did emeralds, did jewels. Mm -hmm. And I was there, and they did it without the coda. That's so odd. I was beside myself. Who said it, I wonder? I can tell you, but I'm not sure I want to. Oh. (laughs) But when I got back to town, I called Barbara Horgan, who was then still running the Balanchine Trust, and I said, what is going on here? They did it without the coda. Did you allow that? She said, no, no, no. I said, well, who, who did that? Right. This is an outrage. She said, well, here's who did it. So I called this person, mm-hmm. and said, she said, well, there really wasn't time. The dances 
were, they didn't know how to do Balanchine and they were doing, nobody could really cope. So I just left it out. I was not amused. Oh. If you could see our faces right now. <laughs> <laughs> Another Emerald story. This is, well, I wasn't there for this, but you know, Gergiev runs everything. Right. He is the Napoleon of Russian art. And he was scheduled to be conducting. And he was rushing back from wherever he was, and he was late. So they started Emeralds. And he arrived. And he wanted to conduct it. So he stopped it. And they, he, he mounted the podium and started it from scratch. That's insane. Can you imagine as a dancer? No, what if you had done your variation? Yeah, already? you have to do it again. <laughs> that's ego. Yeah. <clears throat> well, I mean, it's it's uh, captured in that documentary where he, uh, he, they do the first ballet. This is when New York City Ballet is on tour to Russia. Uh-huh. Do the first ballet, then he disappears for sixty minutes, a sixty minute intermission, and it was because he and he had taken the whole orchestra with him to rehearse <gasps> in the middle of the performance. Oh my gosh! Comes back sixty minutes later. Hey. I'm, it's I'm time here, now. but you know. Oh my gosh! Now I wasn't Different at that world, performance, I <laughs> so I can't swear that it took place. Mm-hmm. But it was told me soon after the event. Wow! So emeralds, you know, there it is. But it remains very beautiful, mm-hmm. and I think City Ballet does it well now, and Miami does it well now. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. I, I've only seen the rehearsals. <laughs> Um, so we're going to switch gears just like in the ballet. There's a big stark contrast, um, obviously to rubies. So what do you think, um, sets rubies apart in terms of ballets that Balanchine did to Stravinsky music? Well, it's for me, the word that describes it best is jaunty. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that there are, I'm trying to think the other Stravinsky ballets. You certainly can't think. There, there are there are parts of a uh, violin concerto that are jaunty ish. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The waiter, the walking, you know. Right. He always said they were like waiters mm-hmm. going back, but it isn't. That's not its quality, uh-huh. really. No, it's. I don't think he ever made another ballet out of Stravinsky that's like that. Uh, de Car- he did a jeu de cartes at some point. I can't even remember. He did it. That was in the, the 30s at the, yeah, the Met. Yeah, the of course, I never program. saw that. I, I don't think so. Because he didn't have Patty and Eddie then. Mm-hmm. See, I th- he starts with the music. What music does he want to eat? This is my guess. Mm-hmm. That was always first and foremost in his head. Mm-hmm. But then if he's thinking of a ballet to specific music that he loves, he's thinking, I can do it if I have the dancers. Right. So then he can do rubies because A, he loves the music, but B, he has Patty and Eddie. Mm-hmm. It's like Violet and Emeralds, and it's like Suzanne and Diamonds. Mm-hmm. I don't think we would have had jewels did he not have those principles. Mm-hmm. Because whom would he, he wouldn't have made those ballets out of anyone else who was there at that time. Right. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's really interesting that you. I think that's something we know about Balanchine is practicality, but it really, it's the underlying bit of almost every story. You know, he wanted to do Sleeping Beauty for so many years, but he could never recreate some sort of effect that he well, loved. Well, he felt the stage couldn't do it. He couldn't have people come in. I talked to him about Sleeping Beauty many times as a marketer and program mm-hmm. because I felt very strongly what did I know? I'm this publisher and editor. And so, but I'm telling him what to do with the New York City Ballet. It was ludicrous. <laughs> but I remember a long conversation. And I said, you know, Nutcracker anchors the fall season. Mm-hmm. But we don't have that for the spring season. And the spring season was always harder to sell. Mm-hmm. Because people were away. It, the audience wasn't as there. Right. Once we had subscriptions, which was when I was doing it, there was a, there was a, there was a stability to a large part of the audience, but the rest of the audience was not as stable as it was in the in the winter in the fall. 
So I said, what we, you know, what would do it would be Sleeping Beauty. Can't, and of course, I knew that he worshipped the music as who does not. Uh, and he would say, no, because the stage, we don't have the trap doors, we don't have this, we don't have that. I think he was not going to tell me what his other reasons were. He did the one thing. The garland walls. He did the garland walls from which you can infer an entire Sleeping Beauty. It's still better than anything else that anybody else does, which is why Peter so properly and intelligently incorporated it into his own Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. And we've seen many other garland dances from other companies. There's nothing like it. You know, that's what it was. Mm -hmm. That's the spirit. That's what Sleeping Beauty was. Mm -hmm. So he just didn't do it. But... He made his own Sleeping Beauty in 1947, and that was called Theme and Variations, mm -hmm. because that's where you have the sense of Sleeping Beauty. Just as for me, Ballet Imperial has that of Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. You don't think the diamonds... I think the... there's a lot of Swan Lake in diamonds, yes. But not... But it isn't Swan Lake mm -hmm. in the way that Theme and Variations... Is sleeping, sleeping beauty. beauty for me? Sure. Yeah. Let's talk about diamonds a little bit then, because um, I do think that sometimes that Swan Lake-ish quality can be. You mentioned Sarah Mearns. Right. Do you think that that's overemphasized now? Did Balanchine ever? He would never say that, right? No. He see. He unlike Jerry Robbins, he was happy to see wonderful dancers find their own way. Mm -hmm of doing roles. He never tried to shoebox anybody into the way Suzanne did it or the way mm -hmm. this person did it or that person did it. I, I suspect he, he, he knew everything, but he, he had a feel. Look what he did with Merrill. Now, Merrill Ashley, this incredibly dynamic allegro dancer, she was a phenomenon. Uh, my view of Meryl, who I like very much and have always gotten along with extremely well, she started, first you saw her feet. Then you saw, th this is over the years, mm -hmm. then her legs came in, mm -hmm. then her body came in, then her head came in. <laughs> but she was essentially an allegro genius. Mm -hmm. That's, as we see from Ballo del Regina, there's no other dancer could mm -hmm. have done that. That's a perfect example of where he can make a, the ballet he wants to make because he finally has the dancer right. who can do it. Mm -hmm. Well, at some point, he put Merrill into emeralds. And I remember thinking, what? These, this is against her qualities. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't understand it. Why is he putting her... Because she was doing diamonds... Why is he putting her in emeralds? Mm -hmm. And I believe that he was putting her in emeralds to prepare her for Swan Lake. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my view. Mm -hmm. uh, to soften her, to let her grow more lyrical, more expansive, than, than more attacky. You know? right. So that's the way he, he had a view of dancers of how he could nurture them and grow them from this into that. And indeed, there are dancers who can do that, and there are dancers who can't do that. I mean, Kira Nichols, who was in the company when he was still there, but he never created, she was too young to have anything created on her by him. But Kira, the strongest dancer who ever lived, sort of, hmm. you know, implacably solid, doing all the nut-crunching roles. Mm -hmm. Time went by, time went by. And she understood that it was eroding. I'm inferring this. Mm -hmm. I never spoke to her about it. And I thought, what is going to become of her? Well, somehow Kira had the dance intelligence to become a dramatic dancer. Mm -hmm. There was a wonderful, famous piece that Arlene Croce wrote about her in her youth, saying, when is the Sleeping Beauty going to wake up? Hmm. Because Arlene at that point saw her as a stolid dancer as well as a solid dancer. 
No, I never dreamed that she'd become a dramatic dancer. And she found a way. Mm-hmm. And her later years were secured by that. You know, and she was intelligent. She withdrew from roles. You know, she didn't kick and scream the way certain ballerinas do when they have to give up a role. She found other things to do. So her career was extended. And you know, she had injuries, she had this, she had that, doesn't matter. But it was an amazing career. You know, that's another thing. Uh, there are great, great dancers who do great things, but something, their careers go awry mm-hmm. in one way or another, or they end too precipitously. You know, she had a great career. It right. was shaped by her dance and tones. Patty had a great career. Mm-hmm. She was rarely injured. Mm-hmm. And she did every. She could do everything, more or less everything. Other dancers, Allegra's career. Allegra is the greatest dancer as Patty or or, mm-hmm. or Suzanne. But Allegra, as you've read her book, you know she went her way. She didn't want to do that. She wanted to have three children. Fine, mm-hmm. you know she did. She she had a, her plan for her life. So her career was an interrupted career. It was career interrupt us. Mm. <laughs> uh, now, what more he might have done with her and for her, we right. don't know. You know, this is this might be a little bit of a detour, but um, I wanted to talk about dancer versatility because you brought up, of course, um, just now you said Allegra could do everything. And then when we were talking about Meryl, I remembered in my head that in her book, she speaks of she, I believe at that point she was the only person to ever do a principal in all three ballets. Yes, that's what Emeralds, she rubies, and diamonds. Albeit okay. she only did rubies as a throw-on and right. never did it again. Right. Um, but it's something that's been striking me more recently, how things get very um, typecast and specific. You know, Choleric has to be uh, an Amazon. Allegra Kent did it right after Tanny. She's five, one, or two. Um, mm-hmm. You know, Square Dance has to be a compact technician. Meryl was tall. Um, do you think that we've kind of pigeonholed ourselves a little bit in terms of casting? I think it happens naturally. Mm-hmm. But also, I think uh, two things can change or affect it. One, an artistic director with vision about dancers. And two, necessity. You know, I don't have anybody for diamonds. All right, Michael, you're on. <laughs> you know, there's nobody else. Yeah. Sorry. So you go on. Right. You slip into your toe shoes, which right. you've never been in yeah, before. Yeah, I'm ready. And you're I know ready. the part. Right, you know the I've seen part. it enough. And, and then it sticks. I think some things that happen are that dance, and Balanchine was very, very loyal to his dancers. He didn't do what another artistic director might do. He didn't say, okay, she's no longer very good in this, out. I'm replacing her with this gorgeous Mm 20-year-old. He was loyal to them, and therefore we saw things happen that should not have happened. And you don't don't think he knew it? He knew everything. We don't know anything. He knew everything. And it made for weaknesses in performance. There were dancers who just went on too long, including some of the greatest ones. Patty was not at her strongest when she left. Jacques certainly wasn't. Uh, And and others too. Karen, whom he was very close to personally, they went on dancing in certain roles longer than we, the audience, were happy, or we, the critics. However, that was not his problem. These people had given him their lives, and he returned that in the appropriate ways. And then there would be moments, this is my interpretation. One of his greatest ballets, many of us feel, is Liebes Lederwalze. Mm -hmm. And you know what it is, four couples. It was a long slog before the audience took to it. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't matter, he didn't care. Mm -hmm. And by the, by a certain time, it was fabulously cast, Patty, Suzanne, etc. Then Suzanne left. 
So he put Karen in her role. Fine, five years go by, six years go by. And now Suzanne is back. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the point at which I'm doing the programming. Mm-hmm. And all I want in life is to see Liebes Lieder back on our stage. And nobody else does it at that time. Right. So I would say, oh, George, maybe this is the season we could do Liebes Lieder. And he'd say, you know, dear, can't do. And I'd say, he'd say, you know, need wonderful singers. And I'd say, oh, well, you know, there are wonderful singers. He said, you know, too expensive. Betty will say, can't afford singers. <laughs> I said, I said, I personally will raise the money uh-huh. for this. It went, it was a farce. But I didn't understand what was going on. Right. So then after George died, Peter brought back Liebes Lieder. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to some very wise person who was close to him, and I was saying, just explain this to me. And she said, well, it's very simple. He couldn't take it away from Karen, and he couldn't not give it to Suzanne. Mm-hmm. Practical. Practical. <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> Don't do it. Uh-huh. He wasn't dying to see it again. We were dying to see it again. <laughs> so those are the things that, that happen. Uh, then there was the fabulous moment when Misha Barishnikov joined the company. Suddenly, there he was, the greatest dancer probably of all time, entering the city ballet repertory, knowing that he was probably too old, not old to be a great, he went on being a sublime dancer, but too old to adjust his body to Valentine technique. Right. Mm-hmm. But suddenly, all these cast changes, that's why you got certain pieces. When he was doing... Um, Oh gosh, there goes my brain. It's why it's why Yvonne Boré. Did she do Harlequin on with it? It was Har- um, uh, I don't know if it was Harlequin or on. Do, uh, no, he did they Harlequin do on with together. Patty. Okay. Uh, it was some ballet that they needed a gr- and they and they gave it to her. I thought it was duo actually. It was what? Duo? It could have been duo. It may have been it duo. May have been I duo. remember it in I think if I remember correctly. Because Kay was in, no longer in Yvonne's doing bio. Yes. Big written out, you know, did right. did duo with Misha. Well, Yvonne also had connections to the company. Her mother had been in the company. Her right. mother had taught her. She, 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 she Jerry knew, knew her, etc. But that's why how her career started into some kind of large trajectory. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's different in every case. You know, Allegra just turned up. That was it. She came on the stage, 16 or 17, I remember. Mm. And you could not take your eyes off her. And the same had been true of Tanny. And the same was true of Suzanne. But the same was not true of a number of other dancers who had to work and right. get there. And they were the chosen ones. Mm-hmm. You see, And it starts with New York City Ballet. Tal Chief was already a dancer. Mm-hmm. He was retraining her. Mm-hmm. She started as Tanny, of course, had, had was in the school, right. and so she was already dancing in the, in, for ballet society when she was sixteen, seventeen. But it was clear you looked at her; there was nobody else on stage, and nobody has ever reproduced her. Her roles are impossible to fill. Hmm. No one has ever looked in them the way she did. La Valse, I saw it again this weekend. You know, it's sorry. Just doesn't go down. Patty was good in it. Suzanne was good in it. Other people did it. It's never had that elegant French mm-hmm. perfection. Allegra was a chosen one. Suzanne was a chosen one. Darcy was a chosen one. You looked at her. That was it. That's all it needed. You looked at her. She was ready. And he gave her everything when she was 12 years old, you know, 17, 18, <laughs> uh-huh. you know. Others, no. Merrill was a case in point. Mm-hmm. Kira was in case in point. That took time. So as we're talking about this, I'm I'm wondering kind of what the common denominator was with all of these amazing dancers all being at the same place at the same time. And we hear so often that Balanchine was kind of a, a man of few words. So there wasn't so much coaching going on in terms of, um, you know, 
feel this do you know it was kind of more understood in the movement so what do you feel the common denominator was was it just his understanding of how to make it was his understanding of what was inside a dancer Mm -hmm. that could be brought out Mm -hmm. through his choreography by the right roles and the right nurturing Mm -hmm. and the right class remember it was a joke suzanne was not i want to get this right I'm making, I think it was Suzanne was not a bourreur. Hmm. <laughs> and so for months, that's what they bourrees. did. <laughs> the class in bourre, they uh-huh. did bourre in class. Huh. You know, well, Suzanne was special. He never treated anyone the way he treated her. Mm-hmm. But he knew what was there. He kn- now, there may all have also be a question of, of, of affinity. There may have been dancers with just as much capacity whom he just didn't feel like. That, feel like. There was nothing in that dancer at that time in his life that called to him. Mm-hmm. Because he was always, like all choreographers, looking for muses. Mm-hmm. Right. And if the right muse came along, he was there, but if it was the wrong muse, he didn't recognize her as a muse. Mm -hmm. Note that we're always saying she. Right. Because (laughs) men, that was not the way it was. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was never going to, you know, use use men in the same capacity that he did women, but it is interesting that, uh, in particular with jewels, with rubies, you know, Edward is as much imprinted on the ballet as oh, those women absolutely totally it's so his, even if even though balanchine you know made all the the he made it very clear you know it can't be any clearer than ballet's woman he still could bring out immense oh qualities of course. In and he men. did he did wonderful things for men and he understood their value remember in the early days the first days there weren't any men there was Francisco Mancion, and there was, um, come on. Magalanas? What? Nikki Magalanas. Nikki Magalanas. And then he had a Glevsky for classical dancers, a highly trained Russian dancer. Mm-hmm. You know, remember Balanchine came here, he didn't want Russian dancers, but he didn't have any choice. Right. <laughs> he needed a classical dancer, mm-hmm. and the Glevsky right. was wonderful. <laughs> and then there was the ill-fated attempts with Eric Brun. They didn't work out. Eric Brun didn't like it, and he didn't like it. But Eric Brun was still the greatest poet in La Sonambula I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Now remember, again, speaking of that, that Balanchine was in Denmark for a long time Tanny, when, right? when Tanny was, was recuperating. Mm-hmm. And he did a lot of work for the And he staged Sonambula for the Danish ballet. So, no wonder Eric, it was in the tradition of Eric Brun. And he used, as you know, many Danish dancers or Danish trained dancers up to Peter and beyond. So, he made use of what was there. And he made, and he found what he needed. And it was always changing. Why he changed certain ballets, I don't know. Sometimes you feel, and then you hear stories, that there were highly specific personal reasons, as with uh, putting on the end of Foray because who, who, of uh, emeralds. Who knows? Mm-hmm. For instance, we know that he very much liked Caligari, mm-hmm. who was there when he died, of course. Mm-hmm. And I think her career would have been vastly different. It's not that Peter didn't admire her, but that he understood her in a certain way because she came into the company and within two minutes he was putting in roles. Right. And which she then wasn't really able to do. She had to come back and relearn. But he saw something in her that would have been thrilling mm. had she st- had he's been there mm. while she blossomed. Look what happened with Gelsey. No more brilliant dancer ever turned up on the stage of the New York City Ballet. Mm-hmm. She was beyond anything technically. She was perfect, mm-hmm. perfect technically. She didn't want it. <laughs> <laughs> she wanted to do Sleeping Beauty with Misha. You know, she didn't want it. She didn't want him. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to bring up something that apparently some fuss was made about during the premiere that Jules was the first full length non narrative right, right, right. ever. We heard it a million times. I can't imagine having been a selling point. I don't think that was going to bring out audiences in droves, but. Do you think that there's actually something that connects the three ballads? I do. Okay. That's what, yeah, I'd love to... I think the first thing that connects the three ballads... Now, you're talking to a programmer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember. I'm an instinctive and very experienced programmer, if I do say so myself. And others have said it, so I can say it. <laughs> they go together. They are three ballets that are a great program. Mm-hmm. You know... That counts for a lot, because how many programs have you seen at New York City Ballet that were not great programs? Can't count on both hands, that's for sure. That's right. (laughs) We didn't have those. And I don't think we have them in Miami. And so it was a great program. Also, there are certain elements that are connected, like walking. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of walking through that. That's true through those three ballads. Mm-hmm. And although he said himself, it's not about jewels. They just look, you know, they're jewelry. Yeah. They're, <laughs> it's not about jewels. But the fact that there is a jewel element in the costuming, certainly, that makes them cohesive without pounding it into your brain. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I do not like rubies as much when it's not nestled between emeralds and diamonds. Mm-hmm. Diamonds more so works for me, but because uh, we've seen that on its own right. various times. But I don't really like it on its own. And I certainly wouldn't want to see emeralds on its own. They go together. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he knew that too. So yes. They are three separate ballets, but for me, they are also one ballet, Mm -hmm. and they will always be one ballet. Do you think there's one element in particular about this ballet that has made it last so well for 50 years and made audiences still want to see it whenever it's it's three great ballets. (laughs) (laughs) That'll do it. Uh, It's true. uh, Whenever we ask people favorite ballet, um, because usually we'll do this bit at the end where we go through and ask dancers fast questions, you know, what's your favorite ballet? What's the role that got away, et cetera. And um, they always, the easiest cop out is Jules because you get really? all three great ballets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I would, That's so, what I would so, pick myself. It's yeah. not my favorite Balanchine ballet. What is your favorite Balanchine well, ballet? I knew you would ask that <laughs> if I gave you the opportunity. <laughs> the thing is, first of all, you have to understand that Balanchine obsessed people particularly certain critics, have spent a lot of their lives playing Desert Island Balanchine. Mm -hmm. Which five ballets, which (laughs) ten ballets, which twenty ballets, which thirty ballets would you choose? Mm -hmm. For me, the reason it's hard to answer is that at different times in my life, I've had different favorite Balanchine ballets. Mm -hmm. When I was very young, when I was 17, 18, the beginning of New York City Ballet, it was Bizet, mm-hmm. Symphony in C. Sure. Yeah. It was so thrilling. It was so fabulous. Everyone was so great. And it was so compressed on the city ballet stage. You know, you couldn't, everybody couldn't fit on. We, right. we did it on that we stage. We did it on that stage. City yeah. Center, yeah. yeah. So <laughs> you know what that was like. Also, it was, we didn't have a company for it, so people were doubling. Mm-hmm. It was, it was, but it was thrilling. It was overwhelming. And it went on and on and on and on. And you went out flying. Other times in my life, certainly I had a ballet imperial phase. Oh, that's my favorite. Yes. I love it. It had been out of the repertory. Mm -hmm. And he brought it back for Suzanne. And only it was no longer called Ballet Imperial. Tchaikovsky Piano Concerto Number Two. No fun to type out when you're programmed. I can tell you that. (laughs) Uh, It's just overwhelming. It's beautiful. So I went through that phase, which lasted for years. I I wouldn't say favorite. It's not. It's not quite. Well, it's personal. Yes, that's Mm -hmm. favorite. But when you say greatest, that changes. 
I think there is no greater ballet than the Four Temperaments. Mm. It's the first of his black and white ballets, although it didn't start out as a black and white ballet. It started out with the most impossible costumes in the history of dance. But, <laughs> but it's, it, to me, it's the turning point in ballet, in all of ballet. There's nothing like it before, and after it, everything is possible. So to me, it is a more important work than, say, Agon, or episodes, which I love. Uh, so I've had, I always have a 40s. On the other hand, I have been present at times in the New York City Ballet when I thought it was dead. Mm -hmm. It was so terrible mm -hmm. that you couldn't look at it. And very recently, it was in horrible disrepair, mostly because we didn't have a good sanguinic. Without a good sanguinic, you do not have fortis. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, Sarah Mearns, not my favorite dancer, was basically thrown on, and she brought it to life. It was suddenly thrilling again. Mm -hmm. So, and I've seen it, I know, I've lived through like th three deaths of the fortis. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> it's clearly such a great work that it, it can't be suppressed permanently. Uh -huh. Try as a company may do to suppress it. It's uh, the share uh, of ballets. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not it's not going anywhere. I'm trying to think of other ballets that were my favorites at any given. Well, whenever I see Liebeslieder, it's my favorite ballet of all time. Because how not? Mm -hmm. When it's done well, look, they're all. Fa how can Nutcracker? We everybody tends to forget what a great ballet nutcracker is yeah it really is choreography yeah. is so it's, good i mean if there's anything that you're going to get saddled with dancing 50 times a year yeah it, it should be, be waltz the flowers and yeah. snow i mean the girls even though of course that wears on you it's still you still no, but there's how. always that first performance every year of flowers where you're like god this choreography is so good yeah you know it's like always that moment where you and then you get it. to be the mother if you're lucky I do the mother. mother. It's a wonderful part. That's my most favorite part. I was, I was also going to say that um, you were talking about doubling up in Symphony and C, which, of course, Miami City Ballet also had to do. Rebecca famously, because she's medium height, she learned every movement. And during one rehearsal in the studio, because this would not be possible on stage, Rebecca did all four movements. Oh, back good. Back. Because someone was <laughs> sick or injured. I don't know. And then Roma would stop and she'd be like, do you in need a Bizet, second, Rebecca? All four movements. All yeah. four movements. That's a first. <laughs> <laughs> it was so crazy, but it was really fun. I'll never forget it. I'm glad you remember that too. That's fun. <laughs> no, it's favorite ballets. And then you can see Liebeslieder boring when it's not danced well. That's horrible. Is there. Okay, this is two questions. First question Is there a ballet right now that you feel like is sort of teetering on the edge of extinction? Well, there are ballets teetering on the edge. It's not what I feel. Bure Fantasque was extinct yeah. until they did it either the once or shot. twice at the Balanchine Centenary. Yes. Nobody noticed. Well, and depending on who you ask, it was not done very well. That could very well. I saw <laughs> it. I don't remember it particularly. But you see, I saw it every other night because from 19. 48, well, when it was made, 51 or whatever year it was, 49, it was constantly programmed. Well, we didn't have much of a repertory. It was a, a tiny closer. repertory. Right, right, right. Oh, it's the best closer. Uh, and then it faded away. I don't know if Balanchine got bored with it or maybe he never really liked it after Tanny was gone. Mm -hmm. I don't really know. what. Mm. Happened. Then they did it. Then that vanished. Then they did it at SAB. Did you see that that performance? It we was saw the videos year of it. after I left SAB that they did it, so I didn't see it live or didn't dance in it. Because when Miami brought it, many of the people had I, just come from SAB. When I saw it at the SAB, I came back to Miami and said to Eddie, "We have to do this ballet. Mm. It is so wonderful and wonderful for us." Now you see, it was pre Eddie. He was never in it. Yeah. He may be still he may have arrived when they were still doing it once right. in a while. But it was not a ballet from his period. Sure. So he was he said he, I I got um, a tape 
And we all looked at it, and of course, we fell in love with it. Now, you may remember, you, you weren't there the first time we did it? I was there both times. We were there yeah. both times, yeah. The first time we did it, as you may remember, the audience didn't really take to it. But when we brought it back, because Lourdes loved it, it exploded. Now, was it a better cast? Probably. I was doing the principal, so I would say yes. Uh-huh. The second <laughs> cast. Yeah. Yes. That's right. You did, and, the, you did the Jerry roll. Yeah. And we did it in New York, too, and that seemed yeah. to be a huge reception as well. Huge, because for New York, it was an unknown balancing ballet. Right, right. And um, why companies around the country don't? Well, it's big mm-hmm. and it's expensive. Right. There are a lot of costumes, needs a lot, a lot of, of people. Uh, so it hasn't been jumped on, but I think it's a masterpiece. Mm-hmm. Now, I have to say, I know you did First Movement. First Movement has never looked as good as it did, no matter who has done it. I'm not going to take offense if you say don't because you were not Jerry (laughs) and Tani. I mean, Jerry was a wonderful dancer, Mm -hmm. a wonderful character. He he brought back um, Balanchine brought back Prodigal for Jerry, right? Absolutely. And he was fantastic and deeply moving and wonderful. He was just a wonderful dancer, but not a classical dancer. Mm -hmm. You know, he was wonderful and fancy free. I saw the first cast, Hmm. but my, this was long before I was at city ballet. Right. Uh, he was a wonderful dancer. So Bure and, and Tani was unique, as I've said before. So And they loved each other. They were very, very close personally. So you could see that they, they together in that were comparable to Eddie and Patty in Rubies. Hmm. That makes sense. I, I like that. I can see that. You're, you're never going to see it again. Yeah. Whereas you're going to see tall chief rolls. Everybody has danced tall chief rolls. Sugar Plum Fairy. Everyone and their mom has danced Sugar <laughs> Plum Fairy. Firebird. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he, he brought that for her. He, he put that on for her. Whereas a role like Scotch Symphony, which was the last role he made on her, and I don't know why, because it was not good for her, Scotch can be done by a million people, mm-hmm. and it doesn't lose its quality. Right. Because it wasn't specifically Tall Chief. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wanted to make it. The music is wonderful. He had an idea. But how many dances have I seen do it wonderfully? Tens, if not scores. Right. Mm. It just suits a lot of dancers. Right. Huh. Yeah. Interesting. If uh, Let's talk about ballets that are actually extinct. If you could bring one back, what would it, what would it be? Well, I think it would be the the better or the best of his baiser de la face. All we have is the thing. The divertissement. The divertissement. Now, we have just done it, as you well know. Mm. The Ratmansky version, which has is mostly wonderful, I think. I, I have problems with bits of it. But... Uh, I know Arlene felt it was the great missing valley. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'm, I'm biased in that direction. See, we, to a certain extent, we have seen the extinct ballets because he cannibalized. It's true, yeah. So you don't want to see like bits of La Valse or not even, what am I thinking of? I don't know, it'll come to it doesn't. He cannibalized. Mm-hmm. So you don't want to see those older ballets that he cannibalized mm-hmm. from, and he didn't want to see them, certainly. Mm-hmm. Now, when we get to the Raimonda, we get to something like Justin's new version. Did you see it? Uh, no, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm talking about two different things. Right. <laughs> I'm taking it back. Um what did we just see? The Raimonda that we just saw. The Raimonda Cortege? Cortege. Cortege. When we get to Cortege, he has already done it three times, use that music. Mm-hmm. But it was there. So if Cortege disappeared tomorrow, I would applaud. Mm-hmm. You know, people don't want to think that way or talk that way, and they're shocked. 
but I no need ever to see it. Again. I, I prefer Potides, which is oh. more similar to Cortege than Raimonda variations. I yeah. think Raimonda and Potides can coexist, right. but no Cortege, Cortege in the mix and throws Absolutely the balance. Right. Out. And as for Raimonda as a whole, have you ever seen a complete nine act, 14 act? I don't Raimonda? think I could put myself through that. You could. Well, I will tell you if you want to know masochism <laughs> at its height. At one point, maybe it was ballet theater, brought Nureyev's Raimonda. There were five casts, hmm. and Arlene and I went to all five of them oh, consecutively. <laughs> and a more boring ballet you cannot imagine. <laughs> it's a ballet. The story part is dopey, endless, unconvincing, <laughs> boring. And then there's this great music, which mm -hmm. everybody loves, right. starting with Balanchine. And then you wait for those moments. It was a nightmare of horror. <laughs> But there we did it. I was young in those days. <laughs> um, just to bring it back a little bit to talking about Bore that has one of the most incredible finales yeah. ever. Balanchine's obviously so well known for his slam bang finishes. Diamonds also has a really extraordinary right. finale. Theme. Theme. Oh my God. Western Fancy. Symphony. Bizet. It goes on. So is there one, if you had to choose one, that you the feel like is your favorite Balanchine finale? Favorite Balanchine finale. Oh, I couldn't. Well, it would again depend on when I was 19, it would have been Bizet, because mm. I hadn't seen the rest at that yeah. point. No, there isn't one. It's whichever I'm, I'm seeing. You know, it, it, he is on such a level that when he is at his best, which is more of the time than any other choreographer in the history of the world, mm -hmm. how can you compare? Can you say that we haven't even mentioned development at number 15. Mm -hmm. What a great ballet that is. That doesn't yeah. have a finale. Right. It's, it's just a sublime work of art. Mm -hmm. So how can you say Divertimento is it is Fortis greater than but they're not comparable. Right. Mm -hmm. They're totally different. So what you're left with is saying here are Balanchine's 20 greatest ballets. And they're all great. Right. When you're seeing them, if they're danced well. Right. And they're mostly, are they dancer proof? I wanted to ask what you think, uh, you know, as we're talking about these ballets that are in peril, what can our generation do to, to help preserve the Balanchine legacy, but also um, make it still vivid for today's audiences? Well, it is a gigantic problem, and everyone is aware of it, including the Balanchine Trust and all the people who most worship him. And the reason is that you're one generation away and two generations away and three generations away, and it dilutes. And different performers come in and do it their way. And, But he knew that. He didn't, he didn't think it could be preserved. At least he said he didn't think it could be preserved, although he arranged things so that after his death, the institutions would be there right. to keep it going, including the Balanchine Trust and the way it's run. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem, and I've written it many times, so I don't mind saying it, is Peter's decision, for whatever his reasons, not to have the great Balanchine dancers on whom the roles were created, coach. And that has done tremendous damage to the future. I am not an anti-Peter person, although I've often written um, negatively about him. Personally, I was very fond of him, and we spent a great deal of time together. And he's done some wonderful things, starting with keeping the New York City Ballet afloat mm -hmm. and in pretty good shape. You know, it changes, it changes. But that has been a disaster because the coaches we have now just do not know. And you know perfectly well that certain dancers in certain roles have sneaked off to be coached by certain X principles in roles that were created on them because they need the 
input. That's why Eddie, when he was running Miami and Lourdes now, bring people down. Because I claim, you, you were both there. I think you were both there. When we were doing, we, at one point we were bringing, putting Sonambula back on, or whatever it was, and I wanted Allegra there. I remember that. I didn't Ooh, want Allegra good. there to give specific coaching, which she did do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But I be, since I believe so strongly that Balanchine extracted what he wanted from the dancers. Mm-hmm. Now, it wasn't made on her, remember, but it was brought back after all those years. Right. And she she didn't she was not like Daniela to the original. So it was like a new ballet when, mm-hmm. when he put it on for her. And I believed that for dancers just to see her, to sense her, how she moved, how she reacted, was a big plus. That it would somehow osmos into right. into them. Yeah. I, I myself paid to bring her down because we didn't have, of course, as always, we didn't have a penny in the bank. Uh, or in the payroll, for that matter. <laughs> but... And I felt that again and again, and Eddie felt that. That's why, as you know, for the, when he first did Jewels, at different times, he had Patty, Violette, and Suzanne come and mm-hmm. coach. So I think it's crucial to have those dances. Now, that's going to be too late very soon. Mm-hmm. How many people are left? Allegra. Mm-hmm. You know, who's left from the great days? Eddie? Patty? And Suzanne. Makes sense. This is maybe a light question to finish on, but since we brought up Meryl doing every one of the jewels, is there a dancer today that you would enjoy seeing in all three? At City Ballet? Any company. Any company in the world that you well, would like to see. For, no, first of all, no company in the world should be able to do jewels as well as City Ballet. Hmm. Miami can. But Miami's limited in the number of dancers. Right. You know, we have 50 dancers and they have 90, or whatever the number is, 120, who knows. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and they have waves of polished dancers coming out of the school. You know, we are looking for the odd polished dancer. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, So it's a very different thing. I don't think we have a dancer who could do all three. The one who I think has the greater, the, the like, the most possible is Sterling Hilton because she's the smartest. Say Sterling. I had a, yeah. She is the <laughs> smartest and she works the hardest. And she grows in roles. I mean, I remember seeing her the first time she did Calcium Nightlight. It was so terrible. I think, did she do it with Fairchild? I can't remember. That would have been, yeah. They were both so terrible. They didn't have a clue as to, they were adorable. (laughs) Now, calcium is many things, but adorable is not one of them. (laughs) Remember, it was uh, Heather Mm -hmm. and Danny Duell. By the end of the season, I mean, I, ro- I really ripped it apart, and I think others did too. By the end of the season, Sterling had figured it out. Hmm. She wasn't right for it. She wasn't terrific in it, but it was completely respectable. Because she works, and she works, and she studies, and she goes to the library, and she looks at tapes, and she thinks. And she has that wonderful instrument, the physical instrument. Mm-hmm. And she's so pretty, but she doesn't. She doesn't get by on her prettiness. Mm-hmm. No, I've seen her in roles, and I think she has a long way to go, like Sonambula, uh, something else that she did fairly recent. But she will get there. Mm-hmm. So I think she could make a stab at doing a good job at all three roles. What do you think? I love yeah, that. I like to. I, I also think that. Sterling is a good choice because she's petite, so she can do patty roles. Because no yeah. one really, you don't necessarily want to see a, I mean, not height and, and long, everything is beautiful. But Sterling is petite, but with an illusion of length. Yeah, like patty. Like patty. Patty was tiny. Mm-hmm. 
her. She's nothing like Patty in her right. her plastique or, or her manner. I think she could. I would like to see her in all three roles. I would be happy to see her in all three roles. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure even which of the emerald. Probably the violet role. But who knows? Right. Well, right. thanks so much Thank for you so talking much. us talking to us today. You've got about. two programs worth. <laughs> I think that's great. That's great yeah. for us. Thank okay. you so thanks much. So much. Oh, you're very well. You know, I love to talk, and as you see, I can talk. But you knew that. You've <laughs> I've talked at you for years. <laughs> Thank you for joining us this week. If you are new to our podcast, we invite you to check out some of our other interviews with the ballet world's best and brightest. If you like the pod, or even if you don't, we would truly appreciate it if you could take a second to review us on iTunes and let us know what you think. Thank you again for listening and supporting Conversations on Dance. We will see you next week. Bob has been editor-in-chief of Simon & Schuster, Alfred A. Knopf, and The New Yorker.